Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm done, joined by Tony Zhang from Options Play in New York. We're going to talk about a couple of stock ideas that are top of mind for him. Overall, the market choppy, sort of the uh, the hangover day, the uh, the digestion day after yesterday's big meal. Quite the distribution yesterday. The 50-day moving average in play uh, once again for the S&P 500 breaking below it. Today's sort of a choppy day. This is a normal day after. The question, as always, is what's next? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the activity the market's using, the power of stock charts, using data visualization techniques to better understand price, breadth, sentiment, trend, momentum, all those tools in the technical toolkit to help us quantify investor psychology. Overall, this sort of day, this choppy sideways day where the S&P is flat, but a lot of movement uh, during the day is pretty classic after a, after a big drop that we had yesterday. Yesterday was the big gap down. Today is sort of the normal transition day. And, and I think, you know, what's next is, uh, is a question for, uh, for the charts, looking at what levels have been able to hold, which levels have broken. Particularly, we're going to look at the breadth conditions. And, I, you know, if there's one thing that has not changed in the last uh, 24 hours, I think, is the deteriorating breadth conditions. I've, you know, We've watched some of the question marks that have been part of this uptrend over recent months. And I think the uh, exclamation point to that breadth deterioration was, uh, was the last week or so and really uh, culminated in yesterday's distribution. You know, Based on what we're seeing, we're gonna look at the chart of the S&P 500. We'll focus on some of the key levels, but also the breadth conditions underlying those. Now we have great guests on this show. I'm super excited to talk to uh, Tony Zhang uh, here in a few moments. Uh, tomorrow, we have Jay Pettit from Charts Avenue joining us. Next week on the 28th, we have Alessio Ritigliano. Alessio is from Wyckoff Analytics, uh, focuses on cryptocurrency. So very interesting to hear how he's applying that toolkit to a very volatile market, a market also in distribution. And then Dana Lyons from the Lion's Share Report joining us on September 29th. Also, our next episode of The Pitch is airing on uh, September 28th. You can always go to stockcharts.com slash the pitch to see some of our previous episodes and also who's coming up uh, this month. Should be a lot of fun. It is a stock picking showdown, three different experts providing their uh, five ideas each, and then we debate them as a group. Should be, uh, should be a ton of fun. Let's continue on today's show with our market recap. We're going to start with a poll. We always have a poll running on our live stream page on stockcharts.com. Also on social media, we'll, uh, we'll send these uh, questions around as well. We asked you recently, what is your average investment horizon? A couple minutes, a couple days, a couple weeks, a couple months, and ask you to sort of uh, allocate your or focus on what is your most uh, sort of normal investment horizon. A couple months was by far the most widely answered response over 60% of you, 25% of you a couple weeks, then a very small handful of you a couple days and a couple minutes. That's sort of what I would have expected. I, I found uh, a lot, you know, most average or on average stock charts users are not day traders. You're not looking minute to minute. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you have some long-term accounts where you're looking years and years down the road, a retirement account where honestly, your best approach with a lot of those is to not touch it and just let things grow, let time be your friend. But you're focusing in on a couple months. Now, I didn't, I didn't uh, you know, offer a couple years plus as one of my answers. Maybe some of you would have answered that. But really, the essence of that question is to drive home the interplay of the different timeframes. And regardless of what you said your investment horizon is, I hope you recognize that that horizon also is related to a shorter term time frame. There are days and minutes that you know sort of culminate or, or add up to those uh, weekly and monthly trades, but there are also multi-year long-term uh, trends, sort of the, uh, the economic cycle, right? The business cycle that are in, in play as well. So make sure you focus on the different time frames, not just the one that you're trying to play on, but the other ones and how they relate to where you're, uh, where you're focused. As I mentioned in the introduction, the S&P really choppy today, and you can see it netted out to a, a zero. The S&P finished just below where it started uh, at the close uh, or finished the day at the close yesterday, closing just below 43.55. Uh, 
The NASDAQ 100, the NASDAQ composite up a little bit, but again, all of these were around zero. Same with the mid caps and small caps underperformed just a touch, but more of a rounding error. Everything was essentially flat for the day. This was a lick your wounds sort of day, I think, after yesterday's yesterday's drop. The VIX coming off a little bit, but still very much above 20. And we've talked about that VIX 20 level. We looked at that chart uh, yesterday in a little more detail, and uh, and potentially that pattern is broken for a while, the last couple of months, this was pretty easy. Wait for the VIX to go above 20. That's a buyable dip and move on. I, I don't know if I would classify this just yet as a buyable dip. I'm still seeing plenty of deterioration that tends that suggests you need to spend more time and or price, right? It's a, a market can correct in terms of price and or time. We may be seeing, uh, seeing more of both. Uh, we'll have to look at the charts and see how that plays out. Yields a little higher today with the 10-year yield up. Uh, closing around 132 on the 10 year and the uh, bond prices that we use, the TLT is our, our proxy for that. Uh, essentially flat for the day. Same with the US dollar. Commodities uh, essentially mixed. Gold and silver, though, precious metals were in the positive today. And the GLD had a pretty good day uh, yesterday as well. We're going to look at that chart here in a moment. Uh, if we have time, it might be an interesting uh, look to see how precious metals are, are holding up there uh, as uh, other risk assets are starting to uh, struggle. Cryptocurrencies continue to be in distribution mode. Uh, Ethereum down today, Bitcoin down, and, and most of the top 10 uh, cryptos that we follow on our, uh, on our market overview page, all in the red uh, today. Sort of a, a rounded pattern to the last 24 hours, but uh, continue to be in this downtrend. And on something like Bitcoin, We've talked about the importance of that 42,000 level, the 44,000 level uh, key support levels that have uh, that have held uh, in previous uh, previous pullbacks and previous rallies. I put a video on my YouTube channel a couple of weeks ago talking about Bitcoin, particularly on that 42,000 level, why that was so important. So make sure you check that out if you've uh, if you're not really familiar with the dynamics of that uh, of that market. Looking at a chart of the S and P 500, so uh, you know again uh, the move yesterday, while the severity of it certainly could have been a surprise by the you know the gap lower, the move lower, all could certainly catch you off guard, and I totally would not be uh, you know I would not be surprised to to hear that the direction of it should not be a surprise. We've talked about the deteriorating conditions, we've talked about the importance of the 50-day moving average and how the movements in those uh, in, in, or how the, the 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 fact that the market has found support there so many times is sort of a mixed blessing. In some ways, it's super encouraging because all you need to do is wait for the 50-day to uh, to come into play. You expect it to hold, you expect it to go higher, and this is a very easy game. The problem with that is what happens when it does not hold, and that's the condition that we see ourselves in uh, now. Yesterday's gap lower was severe. We broke below the August swing low, which is a bit of a concern. Today, we actually uh, opened a little bit higher above the close, but sold off and closed below yesterday's close as well. So we're down a little bit, but certainly seeing some short-term distribution. The concerning, uh, you know, the thing that I would focus on is the fact that not just have we broken the 50-day and starting to get some follow-through, we're also starting to fail at uh, the uh, August lows, that swing low. And as we talked about, right, Charles Dow's version of an uptrend, higher highs and higher lows. Charles, uh, Charles Dow's version of a downtrend, lower lows, and lower highs and breaking below that August low and staying there. That's around 43.60, which was uh, we closed below there today uh, yet again. That's an indication that we're now starting to see a lower low, which tells you potentially that the whole dynamics of this market are starting to shift more from a classic uptrend to a classic downtrend. We talked about those conditions to look for a lower low, a lower high, breaking the 50 day breaking RSI 43 of those four have now been validated. All that would confirm that sort of general bull uh, bearish rotation that we talked about is a lower high, and that could you know, potentially signal much further. The RSI, by the way, that I mentioned, remember in a bullish phase, the RSI tends to remain above 40. In a bearish phase, the RSI 40 level a lot of times will not hold. And that can a lot of times just condition, indicate that that whole range is moving uh, lower a little bit, certainly something to uh, pay attention to. I mentioned gold and I just want to look very briefly, you know, in any time when the market is doing one thing, you look for asset classes or charts that are doing something different. Those outliers can be interesting to identify some, uh, you know, some opportunities, right? What, what does not look like uh, the other things that, uh, that are on your radar? Gold and precious metals have bounced and the GLD in the last uh, couple of days has bounced higher while uh, stocks have gone lower. So it's turning into a bit of a safe haven uh, in a way that has not really uh, played out recently. You know, if you think about 
the movement between stocks and, uh, and, and gold. At times, they've been closely related. They've been highly correlated on the positive side. Other times, they've moved uh, in a very uh, differentiated fashion, very uncorrelated fashion. The line in the sand that we've talked about for the GLD many, many times is sort of this 171.50 level. That's the peak from July, late July, early July, or early August, and then again, early in September. We keep hitting that level. We keep coming off of there. And I think if we do continue to see a push higher, as always, it's looking at where we're at relative to those resistance levels. Can the GLD get above 171.50? Uh, can the RSI get above 60, which is where it's been for the last couple months? That would suggest to me a potential rotation higher. We only have about a minute left, but I did want to finish off just talking about some of the breadth conditions. My very subjectively color-coded indicator of breadth, this is looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines for uh, large cap, mid cap, small cap, and then the New York Stock Exchange. I've color-coded these all red because they've all they're all below the 50-day moving average now, and they've all broken down through their most recent swing low from August. And just today, uh, last two days now, you've seen the uh, S&P 500 AD line get below its August low. That is the one that's been uh, pretty much consistently bullish this whole time. While the other advanced decline lines have shown some distribution, the S&P advanced decline line, the large cap AD line has continued to be positive. Now we're seeing weakness even there. There's elsewhere in the breadth conditions where we're seeing deterioration, but we'll have to leave it there in terms of our market recap. We're gonna take a quick commercial break back with my guest, Tony Zhang. We'll see you in a minute. Hey guys, welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's so good to have you join us every weekday after the close as we break down the market activity using the power of stock charts. A couple quick announcements before we get to my guest, Tony Zhang. First off, questions are very, very welcome. We're going to do another mailbag segment a little later in today's show. We love to hear from you guys. Uh, feedback on your, our guests, your hosts, and what we could do uh, to make these shows more valuable, but particularly questions on technical analysis, on technical indicators, on investor sentiment, psychology, whatever it is, we'll do our best to point you in the right direction. The best way to get your questions to us is via email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We are on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We're on YouTube. Just put a comment below the Stock Charts video that you're watching. We'll do our best to answer your question in our next mailbag segment on Friday's show. Also, do me a favor, go to stockchartstv.com. Use your email address. You can set up a free account. Start watching all of our great content immediately on demand from all of your devices. Uh, great special events like the pitch, our mid-year market outlook, our year in review coming up in December. Great guests like Tony Zhang and many others. Go to stockchartstv.com or just search on any of the app stores on your mobile devices for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Tony Zhang. Tony's the chief options strategist at Options Play, coming to us uh, from New York. Uh, always a pleasure to have Tony on the show. He really knows his stuff, knows options, and knows the markets very well. Tony, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me, David. Looking forward to talking some charts today. So plenty of things happening. And I, I feel as we were chatting before the show, it's hard to summarize all the things that we've seen just in the last 48 hours market-wise. I mean, a lot of, a lot of changes, a lot of uh, rotations. You have two charts to talk us through. First, Target. Talk us through the big box real retailer Target. Yeah, I've been looking at Target here for a few weeks now, ever since it broke that primary uptrend, a very strong uptrend, I would say, since uh, that those March lows. It has greatly outperformed its sector, the consumer discretionary sector, the retail sector, um, over the past uh, six months or so, if you will. And once it broke below that level, we've seen this uh, target underperformed the sector. It's broke below the 20-day moving average and recently broke below the 50-day moving average. And now we're starting to see the 21-day moving average cross below the 50-day moving average. So price action here looks weak and we're starting to break below the 240 level, which has been a pretty critical support level since it broke this uptrend. So once we see this up, the, the, the uptrend break, we'd like to see it also break below some support levels. And that's exactly what we saw for the first time here yesterday. And going into today's weakness, or, and the weakness that we've seen going into the close, you know, my expectation is that we're likely going to see some further downside 
Um, we've also seen RSI be persistently below the 50 level here, um, showing weakness on the momentum side. It was rejected at that 50 level here just a couple of days ago at, when it tried to rally above the 21 and 50 day moving average, but failed there. So everything looks like this is headed further south. One of the strongest retailers um, clearly you know, starting to lose ground here relative to the sector. Uh, not an encouraging sign, and I think that that's such a beautiful illustration of that rotation. You mentioned the RSI just kind of being in sort of the bullish range and rotating below fifty and staying there so far. It's a it's a it's a great example of a of a rotation. Chart number two, same sector but a little different name. Booking BKNG. Yeah. So when we look at the market right now, after especially over the past couple of days, there are still a couple of industries that I would say that are holding up pretty well in this market. You know, really the reopening and the travel stocks have been uh, the two the two industries that I've been looking at that have held up well. Um, you know, across the entire travel industry, if you look at Expedia, if you look at Airbnb, today was up five percent. Um, Booking.com for me looks the strongest out of all of them in terms of those travel names. Uh, certainly str stronger than the airlines. I think a lot of hotels are also set up uh, nicely for a potential breakout, but booking has, uh, uh, you know, confirmed that double bottom around 2650 or so, a uh, 2050 or so, um, that double bottom. And that's when the underperformance to the, um, the market uh, started to end. You know, as you can see, booking has been underperforming the market pretty much since March. And we've seen that underperformance start to uh, end and we've started to see it outperform the market. And not only does it outperform the market, it's also outperforming its industry, you know, the travel and tourism industry. So that's really what I'm looking for. And the recently after it broke out above that, um, uh, the 20 and 50 day moving averages to the upside, it's come back to retest those level as support and so far holding those. So that's confirmation of that breakout is now conf uh, is holding us support. And I'm looking for a continuation back towards uh, the all time highs and uh, kind of a bit of a reverse of what we've seen here in Target. The RSI has persistently held above the 50, 60 level here, um, shifting from that downtrend back into that bullish zone, if you will. Um, so momentum certainly positive and potentially can carry it forward. And it's not overbought yet. So I think there's some uh, further upside. These are great examples, Tony. I, I love the illustration of just how thinking of these different inputs together and how you're putting together a, a great mosaic for these two different stocks. You know, when we, we were talking before the show just about the overall market environment and how we started to certainly see some distribution in the last couple of days, stocks like Target, you know, clearly breaking support. When you look at what the market has done year to day, when you look at a week like this where you're starting to see distribution, does this feel like an opportunity? Does this feel like, great, I'm going to have an opportunity to get in on weakness on names that have had such a run? Or does it feel more like the time to be getting defensive and just looking opportunistically for things like booking that are that are holding up? I mean, how does this sort of move make you feel relative to uh, the trend so far? I think that's a great question. And I think the answer to that question, at least how I've been positioning, is really both. I think there mm. are opportunistic uh, uh, bearish opportunities right now. There are quite a few, uh, a lot of stocks that have been in distribution mode, big stocks, Shopify, uh, GE, these, these types of stocks that have been distribution for months that are starting to break below some major support levels. I think you could see some further uh, acceleration here to the downside. And at the same time, I do like being defensive. You saw Procter and Gamble hold up pretty well, you know, in the defensive names you see, you've seen the travel stocks hold up. The semiconductors are holding up fairly well. So I think there are, plenty of opportunities here in this market for both directions. And I think the volatility is something that we've kind of been looking for for quite some time. Things have been very quiet for a while, not a lot of movement. And we've been talking about the lack of participation on this rally pretty much for uh, it, what feels like months now. Um, and we're starting to see some of that resolve itself, if you will. And this is some of the opportunities that we've been looking for for months now. You know, an option trader, a friend of mine used to say volatility is opportunity. A lot of us think of volatility as risk, you know, that there's a danger of something happened. He he always said volatility provides opportunity, right? Without that, the charts don't get to move as much. Uh, Tony, listen, thanks for coming on. You guys at Options Play do such a great job of trying to make equity derivatives make sense. And I know there are certainly plenty of ways people can plan potential downside or manage risk using uh, options. So thanks for what you're doing and thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. That's Tony Zhang. Tony's the chief options strategist at Options Play in New York. Two great illustrations, those two charts that he said. It was it was almost a, a little mini masterclass in how to talk through 
uh, the chart, it, it took me back to, uh, you know, teaching new technical analysts and having them, you know, think of the chart as a checklist and look through all the steps. If you if you listen to what Tony did as he was describing some of those charts, particularly booking and thinking about the momentum characteristics, how it's performing relative to the sector, relative to the market, key support and resistance levels, the moving averages, sort of hitting on all of that, and then thinking about the weight of the evidence overall and uh, and seeing a good opportunity there. Great, great take from uh, from Tony Zhang. Let's continue on today's show with our uh, with our mailbag segment, the final bar mailbag. As a reminder, we love to hear from you. And our best uh, best way to get your questions to us is via email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. Let's get to question number one. I have an alert set for when the VIX gets over 1895, then I'm protecting positions rather than looking for new entries. I've noticed several times we've gotten a tremor or two before popping up into the mid 20s. Is this something you look for? I don't know if it's a really good thing or a really bad thing that I kept this question. We didn't get to it on, on Friday. And of course, since you asked that question, uh, whoever said this in, we've had quite the, uh, the movement. You know, this is the chart we're looking at. We talked about that. Uh, you know, in recent weeks, we've talked about the VIX and just this uh, this pattern, right? Every third week, you have expirations, uh, options expiration. Uh, you have the VIX kind of uh, pop higher. The market pulls back a little bit off into the 50-day moving average. That's the Bible tip and we go up. I hate to use the four letter, the, the four word phrase, this time is different, uh, but certainly it's cert- starting to uh, to play out that way, right? You're, you're, you've broken well above 20. And I think your your idea of looking for the the blowout in the VIX or the, the, the spike in the VIX of, uh, and, and thinking about protecting positions, I think that makes a lot of sense. Because to be honest with you, these pullbacks can be opportunistic. The problem is when the pullback doesn't hold. And I was taught all large losses begin as small losses. So when I see moving averages come in play, when I see stocks um, you know, start like Target, breaking moving averages and breaking down, that to me makes me think more about risk management and less about opportunity. Because I feel like if the uptrend does resume, there's plenty of opportunity to get back into leading names that are working or to be in names like Booking and others that are holding up okay. Uh, but the VIX spiking higher after a run like this certainly tells me to think about more about protection, think about stops and updating those uh, you know, and making sure you have a good risk plan uh, in place. So I think there's a lot of w- wisdom just in the phrasing of your question. Um, next question. One day while watching a training video, I saw someone add a date range in addition to the price chart lower down. How do I do that? Um, fascinating question. And let's bring up a chart that has a couple indicators. So uh, right here. So here I have uh, the chart of the GLD and then I have the RSI as a panel and then I have gold as a panel. And I think what you're asking is I saw someone that had date ranges down there because sometimes uh, on some charts, if you have a ton of indicators, all of a sudden you can't see the date anymore. And it's hard to tell what's what. So there's actually an indicator down here called date time axis. If you add that and then just move it around to where you want to be. So here I'm kind of putting it between these two indicators. And now I have an extra sort of date time. Just repeats what you see elsewhere. But usually we put it right below the price. Usually we put it at the very bottom of the chart. You can add those in there. And with some charts with a big uh, series of indicators, that can help break up the chart, separate it, uh, but also help uh, help you focus on the uh, the dates. I, I think that's what you're asking for, and that is how you do it. It's an indicator uh, called date slash time axis. Next question, is there a way to chart the S&P 500 and exclude the FANG stocks? For example, using the S&P my, dollar sign SPX minus uh, dollar sign NYFANG. If yes, what does that chart tell us about the performance of the S&P 500 excluding the FANG stocks? So that's a really good question. And the short answer is no, we don't have a way currently on stock charts to um, you know, withdraw certain holdings like from an index. Because what you're basically trying to do is, I want this basket of stocks, but I want you to take these five or six names and show me the other 500. Um, and uh, and so unless there's an ETF that tracks that sort of thing, we don't have a great way to, uh, to track that. Having said that, the reason why I love your question is that's something we're looking at. We don't have some of the portfolio capabilities that we're uh, that yet that we're looking to build into the platform going into next year. And that's one particular use case that we've talked about. It's same thing as looking at financials, but taking out the big banks. There's a lot of interesting things you could uh, you could do with that. The best way I would say that you can start to make inferences about that, and I think there there's still plenty that you can um, think about and uh, and uh, and reflect on. You know, what I would say is if you look at um, a chart and focus on relative strength, you can get a sense of what the uh, index would look like without it. So if you're looking at the fangs relative to the S&P 500 and you look at a particular period of time, you can see whether that basket has been outperforming or underperforming. If you see the market going higher and you see the fang stocks outperforming, that certainly suggests that given the cap, given the, the, the size of those stocks, 
if they are outperforming, they're absolutely uh, propelling the uh, the market uh, higher. When you see the market doing one thing and you see the uh, the relative strength uh, going a different way, that tells you there's a bit of a disconnection and it's not really participating in there. So using relative strength, you can start to make some inferences about that. In terms of the direct answer, not yet. And that's something we're certainly uh, interested in. And again, I, I'd remind all of you, questions like that, things that you'd like us to add to the platform, please send a note to our support desk. We literally track how many requests we get for certain things. And the more requests we get, the higher we tend to prioritize things because we want to give our users uh, what they're looking for. Last question, and then we really have to wrap up. I often have a very hard time finding the most recent videos on Stock Charts TV, not just for the final bar, but for many of the shows. What's the easiest way to find the most recent episodes? And I think you were asking this about YouTube, and I'll be honest with you, on YouTube, they don't make it super easy to manage a list. We're kind of limited to YouTube's algorithm, and they tend to suggest whatever they want to, whatever they want to, uh, to suggest. I will tell you this. If you go to stockchartstv.com, um, you actually, uh, sorry, stockcharts, uh, stockcharts.com and go to the TV tab. Uh, you can actually go to show lineup. This has all of our shows on here and, uh, and every uh, page will automatically have the most recent video uh, featured front and center. So if you want to look at the most recent video, you can see that here in the upper right corner it might be something you've, you've missed, but there's this little thing that says playlist, the final bar. And if you click on that, it's actually going to show you in descending order and you see the little date prints in each of the titles, you can see which uh, episode was where. So we make it a little easier because we have control over this a little bit more than than we would on uh, on YouTube. The other thing I would say is StockChartsTV.com, which is our our uh, on-demand platform. If you go to, if you do that, you'll actually get, oh, that's not it, stockchartstv.com, sorry. If you do that, you'll actually get to our on-demand platform and you can, um, we have it very well organized, all based on dates and you can look at the most recent videos across the board. It's super easy to, uh, to find. So that's where I would look on our live stream page and look at the show listings or stockchartstv.com, our on-demand platform. That's it for our mailbag. We don't have any more time. Keep your questions coming and we'll hope to get to your question on Friday. We need to go to the wrap the week. Uh, sorry, the uh, three and three. Finish the show, Dave. Uh, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is breadth in the form of the S&P above the 200 day and the 50 day. We talked about the breadth conditions deteriorating. This is not news, hopefully, to many of you if you've been watching the show because we've been on this theme of deteriorating breadth. Uh, in April, almost 100% of the S&P 500 members were above their 200-day moving average. That is down to 67% and declining, right? If you look at the trend in the last six months and what the market has been doing and what this breadth indicator has been doing, it shows you that less and less stocks are regaining their 200-day moving average as the market's going higher. Stocks are breaking down through that key smoothing mechanism. And now we are at the lowest level that we've been so far year to date. So when we talk about this time being different, we talk about the conditions being different than previous pullbacks. Charts like this are what remind me that is absolutely the truth. That tells you the story about how stocks are breaking down now more than they have in previous pullback phases. This is not just the same, I, I believe, as some of the previous pullbacks. Also, less than one in three S&P uh, members are above their 50-day moving average, and that's down in a big way from around 92% back there at that same date in April. Chart number two is looking at Dow theory. It is a fairly antiquated way of thinking about market dynamics and the strength of the economy by looking at the Dow industrials and the Dow transports. Having said that, I know a lot of institutional money managers that still care about Dow theory, and that's why I want to care about it, care about it too. If you look, the Dow transports have broken down through their July low and their August low uh, here uh, so far this week, uh, breaking below its 200-day moving average for the first time since uh, over a year ago last July. If you look at the Dow industrials, it is just barely hitting that July low. So you're very close to what's called the confirmed Dow theory sell signal with both the industrials and the transports breaking down. I would also look at what I call the new Dow theory, the S&P and the NASDAQ composite, and see if you get confirmation there as well. Finally, just to talk about the breakdowns in technology, you know, I think when you look at the FANG stocks, if I think of them as the FAN mag, those six names, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, uh, Alphabet, Google, uh, I already said that twice, Amazon, and, uh, and uh, whichever one I forgot, if you look at the six of those, you can see that they've actually, uh, they're, they're differentiated. Some are holding above the 50-day moving average. Some of them have broken the moving average. Many of them, Netflix and Amazon in particular, are sideways. They haven't gone anywhere. On, 
very much in the last 12 months. They're still where they were 12 months ago. There are stocks that are, are breaking down potentially. And I think something like the XLK getting below its 50 day moving average is a concern. Can it hold the August low? And that's what I would think about with the chart of the XLK and others. Folks, that is our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. A special thank you to Tony Zhang from Options Play in New York joining us today. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.